There's a passage in the canon where a young monk is speaking to an old king. And the old king is asking him, why did you go forth? And one of the reasons the young monk gave was that the world is a slave to craving. We live in this world where things are in constant. There's a lot of pain. And when you have a disease, you can't ask other people to share out that pain. You spend your life gathering things, and then they just have to slip through your fingers, either before you go or as you go. And it's still the world as a slave to craving keeps coming back for more and more and more. The king didn't understand that phrase, a slave to craving. So the young monk told him. Suppose that someone came from the East and said there was this kingdom, lots of wealth, as I said, lots of women, but a very weak army. This is the sort of kingdom that would given your army you could take. Would you take it? And the king said, of course. How about if someone came from the South with the same message? Oh, of course, take that one too. The West, take that one too. The north, take that one too. From the other side of the ocean, the king said, I take that one too. Here he is, 80 years old. And as he said, sometimes he thinks he wants to put his foot in one place and it goes someplace else. He can't even control his body that much, and yet he wants to take as much as he can. This is the problem with our minds, is that we're wired, it seems, for craving. Fortunately, it's not hardwired. But it's a habit that we keep following again and again and again. As the Buddha says, we take craving to be our companion. And when we die, that's what we're going to go with, our cravings. And you know how reliable and systematic and well thought out your cravings are. They tend to go all over the place. So when you die, it's going to go all over the place, too. Who knows what, what particular craving, which particular stream of craving is going to pull you on. So you want to work with that right now, while you've got the chance to understand your cravings, to step back from them and say, just because they're pulling in a particular direction doesn't mean I have to go there. Learn how to resist that. Now, For most of us, the problem is that we don't have any alternative. That's where we've been finding our food, and it's like being told that we have to go on a diet of water and dry crackers. Fortunately, the Buddha doesn't give you just water and dry crackers. In the beginning, it may sound strange. He gives you the breath. It turns out the breath can be your friend. You can think that is your friend instead of your craving. Learn how to get to know the breath. It's got lots of potentials. If you can't think of any way to adjust the breath or play with the breath, Visualize it coming into different parts of the body. Going down the arms, and then how about up the arms? You'll notice in a John Lee's instructions on breath meditation, he has the breath mainly going down as you breathe in. But then if you look at some of his Dharma talks, he talks about breath energy going up. There's the breath energy that starts in the soles of your feet and comes up the legs, up your back. There's another one that starts at the navel and comes up the front. These potentials are there all the time. The question is, which potential do you want to emphasize at any one time? That way, you, one way of dealing with this is just looking at what you've got in the body right now. What pains do you have? What weaknesses do you have? If you've got problems with your back, think of the energy coming up from the soles of the feet to strengthen your back. If you've got headaches, think of the breath energy going down. There's a lot to play with, play with here, and as with any friend that you've been playing with, you get to know each other better and better, and you figure out that's more here than just playing. You can actually use this very very malleable element to help both with the body and with the mind. So when the Buddha asks you to look at your craving and abandon your craving, he gives you an alternative place to stay. You develop the path. 
And a major part of the path is right concentration. When you look at the different factors of the path, it has one of the longest explanations. And when the Buddha was trying to find the path, this was the first factor that he came across, right concentration. Then it was a question of finding the other factors to make them all really right. But the concentration came first. This is what we emphasize, to give the mind a place to stay where it can really see things for what they are, and step back from its old friends. There are some old friendships here you're going to have to learn how to abandon. It's going to be difficult because not only these voices in the mind seem to be your friends, sometimes they seem to be you as well. Something pops in the mind and you think it. You agree with it. You believe it. So again, just as you might deal with the breath in different ways by visualizing it in different ways, we'll learn how to look at these thoughts as not your friends. You know, if they're one magic bullet that we could, you could just wipe out all distracting thoughts. This would be a foolproof meditation, and as I said many times before, with a foolproof meditation, you can still be a fool when you've done it. The meditation requires that you think, that you look at what's going on. But it's learning how to think in a proper way. You don't think just off in all directions. You notice that there's a problem and you learn how to approach it strategically. If your mind has a tendency to go for lust, okay, you need to work with things that are antidotes for lust. If it goes for anger, if it goes for depression, what are the antidotes for these things? step out of those thought worlds. The breath is a good place to step out. And watch these things and learn how to question them. And simply realizing that okay, you've been a slave to these things and they don't really care for you. Even though they seem to be your friends, they're not really. They seem to be you, but they don't really seem to be concerned about your well-being. This is why when dealing with a lot of these thoughts, you feel like you're pulling your own flesh out. You build up an identity around a particular type of thinking, a particular type of unskillful metal fabrication. And when you're asked to put it down, you, you feel like you've, you've lost something. So again, the Buddha gives you something in return. You've got the breath, you've got the state of mind that gets into concentration and doesn't really need to think these thoughts, doesn't really need to get in, involved. But to get that concentration, you have to look not only at what you're doing right here where you're sitting with your eyes closed, but look at your life. If you're spending a life with a lot of distraction, of course the distraction is going to come into the meditation. That's why I recommend that if you've got devices here, i.e., Things, little things with screens on them, you turn them off. I mean, it's bad enough that we have to deal with distractions that come in whether we want them or not, but you go out and you look for them. You turn on the device and you look at it. And then you complain that you've got distracting thoughts in your meditation. Well, you were the ones who hauled them in. So the meditation is not just a technique, it involves values. What's really important in life? What are the problems in life that need to be addressed? Which are the first priorities? Once you recognize the problem, then you realize that certain parts of your, what you've been identifying as yourself, you're going to have to let go. Certain things in the mind that you've thought as your friends, they lead you on and they give you entertainment. keep you occupied, but they're not really your friends. They're just taking advantage of you. Learn to see them in that way. Learn how to visualize your thoughts, as, as the Buddha says, something alien. Try to think of some thought pattern that you tend to get into and tell yourself, how, does this look, how would this look to somebody from the outside if they could actually see in and see your thoughts? When you read about the concerns of other people on the other side of the world, it's a lot of times it seems really, really strange. Well, 
your concerns seem just as strange to them. This is what it means to see them as alien. Something it's really, really strange. It's like studying history. They say that one of the best things about studying history is you learn to sympathize with other people from other cultures. Learn to see their ways of seeing things as familiar. And then you turn around and look and see your typical ways of seeing things and thinking about things as strange. So you can get some distance from it. You don't believe everything that comes in your mind. You don't follow along. Otherwise, you're like those water buffaloes in Thailand. They put a ring in the nose of the water buffalo, and then wherever it pulls, you just got to go. So craving is not your friend. Craving is not you. And yet we latch onto it as if it were our friend, as if, as if it was us, and become its slave. And then look at that, the old king who's 80 years old, he's ready to die at any point, still willing to go out and cause a lot of trouble. Just because the mind has no sense of enough in terms of things of the world. Well, if you could turn that hunger that we have for things of the world and turn it into a, a hunger for a true happiness, the happiness that doesn't have to depend on craving, then you can actually accomplish something good, something worthwhile, both for yourself and the people around you. So learn to see these thoughts in your mind as alien. They are strange. And then question, do you want aliens to come over and take over your life? I know a lot of people would like to have contact with other civilizations, but you know what happens when one civilization here on Earth meets with another civilization. There's a lot of killing and a lot of destruction. I wouldn't be surprised if we contacted somebody out there in outer space. One side would get pretty much wiped out, perhaps both sides. Because the different sides don't care about the other. Well, your thoughts don't care about you. Your cravings don't care about you. They just go, and you hang on for the ride. But if you can see them as an alien, they, they don't have any power over you. It's a slavery where we're the ones holding on, and they just go. If we want our freedom, we let go.